Hello, world. Welcome to PG.biz. We are here yet again. And yes, Brian Baglow, my co-host, he is at large. He is somewhere out there finding incredible guests. And that's what we do here because we talk to the companies and we talk to the people behind the companies and ahead of the trend. Today, we have a little bit of all of that in one person because of course, you know about the insane success of Scopely's Monopoly Go and Stumble Guys. I don't need to tell you that. And my guest today, well, he built Scopely as a co-founder before focusing his energy and passion on a project he's going to tell us about today. So, Eric Futuron, it is great to have you. Maybe you don't even need an introduction beyond that, I think. <laughs> I, I appreciate the kind words. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. And it's, it was... More than a pleasure building two successful companies. Obviously, Scopely is off the charts, especially right now with Monopoly Go. But having built uh, before even I moved on to embrace six number one games, which is insane to say. So lo know a lot about the, the do's and don'ts and excited to chat about them. Yeah, it's your track record, basically, Eric. When, uh, when your team reached out to me, I was like, this is great. Someone who took the helm at Scopely at such a time and shaping it when the market was, it was a gold rush. It was legendary. It's something that you're going to see movies about, you know, parties, uh, big times. Is there, I'm just curious, is there a book in this for you as well? Uh, I've been known to write, but I can't say I'm going to write a book, but there are definitely some good stories. I think the, uh, the funny thing is every, every founder loves to talk about their, their wins along the way. There are definitely some hard times. No company, and it's good for the audience to know, every company has good and bad, especially in a downturn like right now. So I think there probably is a book somewhere along the way, and uh, I'd be happy to be part of it. Maybe not write it. Makes me think of, uh, I'll forget his name now, I'm so sorry, but this fantastic person at Fingersoft, not necessarily the founder, but he said, you know, you have to fail to win. And he thinks that that is the secret of it. It is the failure. Even within a game, I think the hard, one of the hard things about building games is even when you have a success, something could change along the way. Apple could change their terms of service. Google could change how they rank. Uh, your, somebody important on your team could leave. Uh, you could have a, an app issue like a crash or a freeze, and then you lose a significant portion of your audience. Like it, there's a bit of paranoia all the way through. Uh, but there's failures along the way, and then you persevere, um, which is part of the part of the stress, but honestly, part of the fun. You get higher highs when you have lower lows. Oh, I like that. That's such a good way of looking at it, and it's true. And you're going to tell us about your company, Embrace. But first, let's go back just a little bit in your backstory because Scopely, well, Scopely emerged a winner. It wasn't an easy path, obviously, um, particularly during your time. It was a different approach to games. How would you describe your leadership style at that time? And what would you say was the toughest call you had to make, sort of the, the most brutal advice you had to give or take? Uh, my leadership style is one where, I mean, it's easy to say, but harder to do. But I tend to try to find really good people, and I call throwing them in the deep end of the pool. You can't be afraid to fail. It feels like it might be a theme today, um, but you can't be afraid to let your people fail as well. And the, the key is when they do fail to be to almost celebrate it, but more importantly, to support them. They can't feel like they can't fail again. So when I say deep into the pool, you throw good people in, you let them tread and you just make sure they don't sink and the good people will stay at the top and they'll keep going. And it doesn't mean you have to tell them every little thing or help them on everything. They, they've got to make mistakes. And then you just support them. So I'm a helping hand at the side of the pool when they have an issue. Uh, so I'll take an, the second question. I'll take an example. I think the hardest thing for any game executive is to know when you are going to release a game or potentially kill it or reinvest in it. I think we were lucky enough at Scopely that we were we had the ability and the track record to raise money. So we were never forced to put out a game, but nine times out of a 10, any game company, especially on their first game, at some point you feel forced to release. And it's not just putting it in a beta pool or trying it in a different country, but like putting it in the store and going. 
And when you're forced to release, your metrics are often not there uh, and first impressions matter. And so when you have a people installing a game and trying it and now not liking it, you're generally never gonna get those users back. And so those first couple of weeks are the make it or break it. So if you're forced to release, you're toast. Um, and you see it over and over. And so I think the biggest thing is I've killed a lot of games, especially early on. Uh, titles I can't even talk about, but some of the biggest movies in the world, we had our we had games built. I had them on my phone and I was forced to kill those games because the metrics weren't there. Like if you have a, you're just looking at the cohorts. Like if your LTV is not higher than your ability to acquire those users and you don't see a path out of it, you kind of have to trust your gut and you don't have a ton of data behind it. But at some point you just got to say, is this worth the investment or am I going to build another game or hopefully not be in the position where you're forced to release it knowing it's potentially not going to succeed. And there's so many stories out there where people release and they're still successful. You can't, I, I just want to empathize with the audience. You can't listen to them. Uh, those are the, the ones out of a hundred. The majority of people go through that gut. Um, and I, I want to give better advice. The advice is look at the metrics. Don't look at the vanity ones. Make sure you understand your core game loop. What is the metric that drives it? If you truly believe in that metric and you trust your gut, you can release the game. People would love to see your phone, I think, Eric. <laughs> there might be know, a people heard. that have a second time around chance because now the world's different, right? I'm just reading today. We're going to have this blockbuster Zelda movie. Who would have thought, right? It's funny. I have all the old tablets over the years. I've kept m almost all of them, including Android tablets, which... I gave to my entire team at one point because everybody had an iPhone and most of the users in the world are on Android. Um, and I have all the test flight and hockey app builds on those, even if we don't support those games anymore. They're just sitting there with the icons. There's some pretty crazy ones. Probably some gems in there as well. Those are clearly the moments that um, continue to teach. What from that skill set have you taken over uh, in the case of Embrace? The core concept for any game continues to be that LTV has to be greater than your ability to acquire it. And how do you break that into smaller pieces is hard. And it depends on the game and the game loop and things like that. But the core is the, the key. And I mean, most of the topics of conversation in today's world are around that. Like it's the margins around the games, the ad CPMs are dropping, the cost of user acquisition is getting harder and maybe not going down, but the quality is going down because attribution is harder. That loop is the pain. It's making sure you're improving your LTVs while making sure your effective user acquisition is working. Um, and anything you can do to help either side gives you a better chance of success, not just for releasing the game, but also iterating and doing live operations and continuing to build the game um, and making sure you're building a sustainable business where you can build more games. Uh, and so when I was at Scopely, I started seeing all the pieces that I felt like degraded my ability to do that. And there were so many products out there uh, and tools and very few that directly understood both the game GM and CEO, but also the PM and the engineers. And they all want to talk the same language and they all think about the metrics, which we're all lucky that we have engineers that actually care about the metrics generally in games, because at the end of the day, they care about the end user's experience. And it's not always true outside of games, especially not. But in games, there's nothing more prideful than like walking on an airplane and seeing someone play your game. And that's kind of what we all aspire to and the engineers do too. So how do you get them to talk the same language? It's hard and they don't. And often different groups get blamed. Like if a crash comes across, which obviously is very visceral and affects both those metrics, then you're in, often it goes to your engineer and they don't have the tool sets to make it work. Or uh, even in performance marketing, right? Like there are constantly innovations in that space to help understand the core metrics and make them work. Um, and so when I was at Scopely, long story short, I got to sit on the front lines of seeing where all these tools are. And we mentioned it was a gold rush. It was. Uh, every user that bought a phone, uh, there were 
tons of them. And today that gold rush is still growing, but it's not a gold rush. You could call it like a copper rush. Like people are still adopting mobile. It's still faster growing than the web in the grand scheme of things. And so in that scheme, it's harder and harder to make good things and the picks and shovels start coming out. And so I identified a bunch of problems, uh, one of which became Max Ads, which was acquired by AppLovin to become their ad server of record. Uh, and this one embrace to help the engineers specifically, but the teams talk the same language so they could all be more proactive and improve every user's experience at the end of the day. We get the better metrics and we can build better games. Let's just talk for a moment about why it's important to make certain that engineering is in on it, that it is part of what can make a better, more profitable game. Because first it was marketing. We were all excited about marketing. Then we moved in like, oh, product is marketing. So now they sit at a table together and that's a great connection. But we're now saying, you know, engineering really is at that table. I'd heard it before. You're a company putting them there, putting them in that picture and breaking down some of that silo. Why? What is the result of that? Yeah, I think there's a couple reasons. And instead of talking high level, I'll try to give an example from my own experience. Um, but if, if, when I was building a game, so I was the first product manager on what, Dice with Buddies that became Yahtzee and is still a top grossing game. Um, that was our first true mobile game at Scopely. And we were figuring out how to build a publishing business, even if we didn't know what that was at the time. Um, when I was building that game, like there were tons of issues. We all have tons of issues. And as a product minded founder, so I was basically a product manager, I would take my phone, show it to the engineer and the engineer would either try to plug it in, maybe try to reproduce it on my phone. There was no way to do it. And at the end, and it became like a blame game, which is the worst thing possible. The worst thing you can do to anybody is to go to them with an issue and not have a potential solution or ability to prioritize it or even know you could solve it. And so I knew it was affecting my ability to build a great game. Uh, my teams knew that. My performance marketers knew that. And yet I had this disconnect with the people that were actually building my games and who could actually affect those metrics. And it sucked. And it created an a, a inability to have the right conversations because the engineers didn't have the right tooling. Um, and so like a frozen startup, it's a really hard problem. Like, is it your code? Is it a third party ad SDK? Is it a backend API issue? There are a lot of reasons. Generally, it is a bad network call. Often it's your own, but there's no way to diagnose it. There's no way to proactively decide it. And the tools that were available, going back to your question, like product managers and marketers, they're naturally reactive. Like product analytics is looking back at the data by definition. In if you're really trying to hit your metrics, you don't have the time to wait a week or two weeks. When you know there's an optimization to be had, you have to jump on it and you have to release it. And the cadence is hard, uh, but that's how you iterate to success. And so the tools need to be proactive. They need to be built around those hunches and they need to allow you to prioritize and give the engineers the tools to do it without having that back and forth conversation so they can empower themselves and be part of the, be at the table and be part of the, the solution and not necessarily the action item on a product manager's plate. And not look back because that is not where they're going. They have to be future focused. And there's another driver. So it's actually perhaps a happy coincidence. I don't know, Eric, but you know, you come out with this approach and guess what? Whether you like it or not, <laughs> you're going to have to pay more attention to this because of course, how your performance metrics stack up, that's going to start to impact your ranking as well. Yeah, Google uh, recently or in the last couple of months and people, many game companies, especially the biggest ones like the Wildlife, which is a customer or um, Miniclip, which is also a customer and many others, they're really realizing it. So for many reasons, Google has released a Google cons console, like they have that always, but they now are taking performance measurements like app not responsive or crash crashes or frame rates and things like that and starting to put a line in the sand and making sure that you have to be on the right side of that line 
for all the primary metrics, which and Android, it's primarily crashes and app not responsive or ANRs. Um, and if you don't cross the line, you're good. But if you're on the wrong side of the line, you will not be ranked. You could be potentially pulled from the store. You'll definitely not be featured. And you got to know that Apple's doing the same thing. They're just more opaque. You have me thinking that, yeah, Apple, Google, they're not doing this necessarily for the good of humanity. They're also thinking that if their stores stay high quality at a time when we're going to open everything up and we're going to have multiple distribution channels and alternative app stores and all that good stuff, they have to offer quality. Oh, 100%. And there's a balance. And I love being pragmatic on this. They're not looking for maximum quality. They know where it hits, where a user is going to shift. Uh, and it's not as hard as it used to be. And as much as most of us probably listening to this love iPhones, in the US at least, doesn't mean our users do. And it's really easy to switch now. The carriers have made it really easy. Apple and Google both fight over it. There's lots of rumors about Apple now releasing apps for Android because of being able to access that user base. Like it's happening. Uh, and so you're right, it's going to get more and more competitive. Uh, and we're going to be in the crossfire. And we're already seeing it on ads and acquisition. Like it's not purely privacy as much as I believe in that as well. It's exactly, I see your face. It's, it's, a, it's a battle around how do I accumulate the ad revenue? How do I own the data? How do I uh, own the end results for the apps in my ecosystem so that they can better acquire users and that they can create more stickiness in those apps? The users keep coming back to their devices and or, or they sell more in app purchasing or ads and they make more money. You have to say, though, it is masterfully executed, the privacy discussion ongoing. I'd like to... Oh, yeah. I hate to be the commander in the room on that one. Yeah. <laughs> that's between us, Eric. That's, that's, that's meeting someday at a, at a Mao or GDC and having a drink on that one. Let's talk about Bye. how you do it. Because how you do it, I love the way you described it because it was so simple. You said you collect the exhaust coming out of apps. Now, I can visualize that. Anyone listening in can grasp that. What does it mean? When I was building games like Walking Dead, it was really frustrating when you had a problem, especially your own. Like I call it the CEO use case, which is every, I'm sure everybody can relate. We find the weirdest use cases. And then we go to our teams and are like, how do we solve this? And the data wasn't there. Like the data is available. That's why I call it exhaust. Like the app ha and the OS has lots of data around it, but no one was collecting it. And while everybody says they do, whether they're logs, APM, replay, product analytics, they don't. And this is why. At the end of the day, every user matters in mobile. Every user experience is unique because they represent a mobile device. And because of that, all data matters. And when you're on the web or PC and console, that's not true. The device isn't moving. The OS is very standardized. There's not a lot of variability. The, it's not really about the user anymore. Um, while you need to understand and monetize them, in mobile, it is. Every user experience is unique, and you have to build companies with that in mind. And I think the engineers and the product managers, UX, they all get that. But in reality, the tools don't. Um, and so when I, I think about like the common pains and the pressure, like there's so many tools, but I'll say it over and again, like, but there's no way to connect the dots. And so logging by nature samples, APM is not a, it's not a mobile concept. It's a server side concept about putting an agent on something and collecting data. It's not exhaust. It's collecting very specific pieces of data. Replay, everybody has problems with it. It's just the visual. Maybe they collect some of the back end. And then you look at like Firebase and Crashlytics. It's a, it's a great product. They're a tail product. Everybody knows they sample. And why I think sampling is bad? Because you're not collecting every user. And so at the end of the day, if you really want to be proactive and you really want to affect your metrics, you have to be able to look up a user, whether it's the CEO, somebody who complains, and then back it out. How much impact, what is that problem? How much impact is it really having as opposed to doing reverse, which is reactive, like a crash comes and then you look at the crash and then maybe you don't have the data. 
You generally don't. You have to implement more logs. You have to go resubmit to the store. And by the time you're going through that whole cycle and trying to collect the data that's already there that people should be collecting in the first place, you're screwed. Like two weeks, four weeks is a long time to solve things. They're not instant like a browser where you can just release and it's there. You're at the whims of Google and Apple's approval process. It sucks. It's frustrating. And then you end up living with these pains. And I felt like it was like a death by a thousand cuts. And so then I know my LTV is degrading. And then I know that that's the paranoia that once the LTV goes low enough, I might hit a death spiral where there's no coming back. And then you see games dying that are great games because they, they hit this moment up there where they couldn't, there's no return. Enough users are leaving. They lose the social fabric of the game. They lose their ability to rank and there's no coming back. It just slowly creeps into your performance. So the exhaust, the exhaust is definitely the goal. Like why not just collect everything so it's there so that you have the ability to analyze it as opposed to re-implementing, creating events, doing logs, like just have it in the first place. So this is data that can stand on its own right? It can solve performance problems, but I think it gets really exciting when you start to layer it because you know the technical data, you know the behavioral data. Um, this layers on top of that. Tell me a little bit about the interplay here because it sounds like we're almost getting to a point where we can create a holistic picture of something that's more than performance. Yeah. I love the question. Uh, I'll go back. I'll keep saying it. Every user matters. Uh, and so when you think of it that way, uh, yes, I want aggregate metrics and I want to understand impact, but at the end of the day, I got to get to the user. And it, if I really want to solve that unsolvable crash or an ANR or performance issue or a slow startup at SDK, at the end of the day, I might be able to solve it off of a whim, but it, for the really hard ones, like that unsolvable crash, you got to go all the way and just look up that user and see what happened. I need to see the technical replay, like every step the user took. What did they press? What were their activities? Where did they pause? But I need to see it layered with the technical. And so it's not just a visual replay. It's the ability to cross them over. And so like if a, a slow startup happens, maybe a third party SDK loaded and then I had a series of network calls and then a thread started running. Like it's the blend of the two that allows you to be more proactive and solve things faster. Um, but it's because every user matters. And I think that's subtle. I think of it this way. Do your tool sets index by user? Like it should be. Like it shouldn't be an afterthought. It's not a property. Uh, it should be the way that your vendors think about your problems. It's because that's how you think about your problems. It's that do not try from Star Wars. You know, it's not, it's not have a hunch. It's know the problem and give your best to solve it. And you can with the data. So what does embrace, for lack of a better word, empower engineers to do better, quicker, faster than before? Because every tool has to do something amazing. We talked about the intersection. Let's talk about the multiplier factor. What am I doing better? How much am I doing better? If I think about like a uh, customer use case, so like uh, color by number, which everybody knows that game. Uh, we all see the ads for it. It's by wildlife. It's an amazing game. Uh, when they used us, like they, I'll use a crash example. Um, because it's visceral, uh, but I don't think those are the primary issues that everybody has. I think there are other things today, but from a crash, they had, they had crash reporting. Most people have more than one. It misattributed the crash. The engineers knew it and misattribution, meaning the crash code that was shown that was grouped wasn't, was their own code, but they knew that that line wasn't the cause of the crash. And so they had no ability to do anything about it. So how does it, how do we impact the engineer? We give them what led up to that crash. We allow them to see other users that had the same one. And again, allow them to be proactive when right now they're kind of getting blamed or pushed or given a series of tasks without knowing if there's an answer. And so in, in some ways it's like switching them from a brute force and the entire, and then switching them to the ability to actually be confident and be a member of the team at the table and solve. And so in that case, because they could see everything that led up to it, they knew exactly what the problem was. It was an 
third party SDK that was firing incorrectly. I think it was 500 and they're relying on the output and then it crashed. And so that's hard. It's a hunch that often it's a third party SDK or your backend, but now you have the evidence to actually do something about it. And so what's empowering is it, I think of it as raising the game. Like if the entire team is on the same page, they're all confident in each other and they all have the best tools, they can all work as a unit and build better. And then over time, build more features and not necessarily think about all these problems. Like my goal at Embrace in some ways is to not have you constantly thinking about crashes and ANRs and performance and startup KPIs. And it's allowing you to get back to just building games and making your users happy and features as well. I like the scenarios and I'd like to explore a couple more because as you said, it's not always the visceral horrible crash. There are others, there are others that you can look at where you're saying, you know, if I just prioritize this or if I make a call on whether or not I should even put my resources toward it, you know, it will have a bigger impact across the whole studio. It becomes everyone's business. Yeah, so let's let's walk through two examples. Uh, and so for the first one, the Google Play Console, the, the hardest ones are these ANRs. And then why they're hard is because the what they show you is where the user left the app. Often the most troubling and difficult to solve is the application not responding or ANRs. So let's dig in and click into the ANR page within the Embrace flow. And I'll show you how to actually tie it to the Google console and solve them. So clicking into the ANR page, you get traditional views that help you understand the impact and the amount of ANRs. But in this case, we're trying to tie it to the actual ranking effect of Google Play. So let's click into the data that is provided to us from the Google Play console. We call that the AEI data tab. Shows you the methods that were captured by the console, but often not helpful. Look at these three, native poll ones, load URL, web view, super not helpful, and that's the common complaint. While they rank you on these, they don't actually help you solve them. So let's help you solve them. So while we have Google, we can actually show you what happened. So clicking into the brace view of one of these methods, you can see that it was based on a Kotlin X coroutine dispatch task run. This is when the thread and the method that started the ANR, as opposed to the one that Google shows that ended it. Also not that helpful, so let's dig in further. And you can get to a flame graph of every method that contributed to this. Often this is where engineers will stop. They can see everything that contributed to the ANR and finally solve it. Not always, and it can be tough. So let's dig in further and use an add SDK as an example. So picking one from the embrace list, com.google.android, you can see ads in the method. Let's dig in. And if we click in, we can see that same flame graph view and all the things that contribute, whether it's a traditional ad SDK and the ones we know and love, like Iron Source and App Love and an InMobi and all the other ones, or maybe it's not that simple to solve. So the best thing about Embrace is you can keep digging in and you can always get to resolution. So digging in, we can see the logs and the activities that led up to this in a traditional view. But more importantly, we can see what the user saw. We call this the user timeline. It is a horizontal view of the behavior the user took and all the technical details that led up to any issue, crash, ANR, frozen, slow startup, or otherwise. In this case, there are a ton of low memory warnings. And if you scroll down, you can see the ANR that's actually a culprit, as well as the network calls that happened before. Maybe this one was caused by chart boost. Maybe it wasn't, but we can see every single ad method that led up to it. And we can see where the ANR started, where it ended, and how we actually want to solve it. And so an engineer looking at this has much better than a hunch. They can now be proactive, solve the ANRs, and improve your rankings and featurings very quickly and finally. And this is applicable to any game, especially on Android, so you can improve the end experience of your users and let your builders, those client-side engineers that love their games, build great games and get back to features. So segue into performance metrics. When I was building like Yahtzee and Walking Dead and WWE and Wheel of Fortune, performance marketing was obviously super important. And so 
you have these third parties reporting on their metrics and how many installs they gave you. And, and then you look at the cohort and the cohort of users that come in off that install could, they often get stuck somewhere in the game. Like maybe it's on a purchase, maybe it's somewhere in the tutorial flow. You want to think it's the data and the user's characteristics, but often it's something more nefarious in the performance of the game itself or a feature that blocked. And then you end up with bad data and you're making bad decisions and then your effective CPI actually gets worse. Uh, and you don't know, you can't trust any of the data sources. And then again, you have to talk a common language. And that's my common thing. It's frustrating to go have an engineer talk to performance marketing and they're both pointing at each other or a third part or your backend team talking to engineer and they're all pointing at each other because they're not, they don't have a single vendor. They're using all these different vendors that are all sampling and no one has a single view of the user. And it's just so frustrating. You can see me like reliving my scar tissue. I was thinking that, you know, the blame games, the arguments, the, the fights, you know, what happened? Was it your fault? What did you do? And it comes down to something like, you know what? They aren't getting past this point in the game. Exactly. Which is the best. It's like euphoric when you actually have proof. Or like uh, another example, uh, we had another game, which I won't mention because I'm going to throw the backend team under the bus. But they were relying on a new feature with API calls to display something, uh, which everybody's thinking about. That's the core, how it works, uh, core of technology, especially in mobile. And there are a lot of assumptions that we don't think about. So I'll get a little technical. Um, the API calls timeout over time. Like they can't stay open forever. But if the timeout window isn't, doesn't match the expectation of the client side, the builder of the game, it can mismatch. And so what was happening was they were calling the back end and before they got all the data, the API would time out and it would be over. And then you'd have a user sitting with the, the spinner of death and that's the death of your game. They'll take it to all the channels, to social, to TikTok. They will, <laughs> that you will burn <laughs> for you these experiences. Burn. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the better, I mean, it was so very us, but the better the game, the more people complained. Uh, so like I, I'm religious on my own game. I play Star Trek. There's, it, it has some performance issues. I'll admit it, but, uh, users stick around. Uh, they would, they spend more if these things weren't there, but they flame that game like crazy, all channels. It's hard to be person on that mobile game team, that studio, probably watching the flaming and being told, that you can't solve these things or you don't have the tools and there's nothing you can do or it becomes like an endless list of JIRA tasks. Like that's no fun. And eventually you're gonna just switch to another studio. I love talking with you, Eric, is because your personal life and your experiences have really impacted your career path and the outcome that we're seeing at this company. You know, they are aligned. It's almost like when I stay with Star Trek, you know, it's like you and the planet, you are one, right? <laughs> In a sense, you know, you and the company, they feel like one. And it feels as if it's your vision somewhere to have brought all these layers together. Was that your vision? I'll be honest. You start a company, you have a vision, but it's really a problem set. And I think uh, that's the honest answer. I think a lot of founders won't say that. You look for a, a, a space that you want to play in, which obviously I'm passionate about games, data, and honestly, ad tech as well. And the three kind of fit, I mean, for our conversation, they fit really well. And there's very few people that have kind of all three expertises like myself. So I'll give myself a pat on the back. But that happened fortuitously uh, through just experience and having built two ad tech companies and then a games company and now a SaaS heavy data company. Um, but that's fun. Like, it's exciting. How do those all marry? Uh, I think the vision was... And I keep like to let the team all work together. And while we're focused on engineering, because I feel like that's the ultimate way to really impact these metrics and make that wheel of iteration faster. Um, at the end of the day, the data we collect and the way we make sense of it is usable by all the different groups. And so if you want to call that marrying it to demographic data or psychographic or product analytics or APM, uh, I think of it as true observability, which is a word that is 
really thrown around on the DevOps side and often in the AI world, but uh, not as much in games, which is surprising. And it's because true observability is collecting everything so that you have a chance to make sense of it. And then the vision was sending the data to each of the, the people in the game team and not necessarily having them to use Embrace, but we'll send the data to Grafana or to uh, a content, ex like an experience product, like a content square or full story or quantum metric, which isn't really heavy in games, but the ideas are there or to an APM. Like we partner with a bunch of the APM vendors because we collect better data that's made better sense. And we bet I'd rather equip the teams with where they have their workflows than to, to try to disrupt it. The teams work, the teamwork is working. I have to wonder now if like some segments of user acquisition are looking at this and saying, you know, oh, you know, we don't have the data we used to. Now I'm jealous of engineering. Um, are you getting any thoughts, any interest, any ideas around how that can be made available to them as well? They're all struggling with not just the privacy stuff on the attribution side, uh, but the ad networks are struggling with targeting. Um, I think on the monitoring, I talked about experience, the product analytics, they're all trying to figure out how they all fit together. And I'm sure the teams are seeing that. So you're right, like the, we're in a kind of a unique advantageous place where we don't necessarily need to figure that out. Like there's gonna be convergence. And in the next year, especially in a downturn, a lot of these companies are gonna probably come together. Like, do we really need that many attribution vendors out there? Obviously there's a ton of stuff happening with Apple and Unity requiring Iron Source and Maloco and a bunch of other ad vendors. Like they're trying to figure out where they fit. And then the backend tools are figuring that out too. Many of them are releasing kind of traditional product analytics. We think of ourselves as the feeder, like better data, higher quality, makes more sense, easier to make decisions on. We'll work with all those parties. And we already do to some extent. You have the mindset, you have the conditions that nurture these ideas. Um, and you also know how to give tough love. You know, it's like you let people go their way. You're not a micromanager. So that works out in your world, let's zoom out to the other mobile game companies and developers. How can they find inspiration, ideas, innovate, iterate? Where do you see there are those those wells of uh, good ideas and good opportunity? So I'll answer in two ways. If you're a game company that's trying to come out, and there's a lot of them now, which is awesome. Like there's a ton of new VCs that are active in the game space. And generally in a downturn, games are counter cyclical. So if you're thinking about starting one and you can make it happen, start it. Um, and to answer your question for that segment, don't overthink it. Like in the grand scheme of things, mobile hasn't been around that long. Um, and so there's a lot of things and game types that haven't been built yet that you should just go for or iterations on existing games that you can definitely be successful. Don't try to reinvent the entire wheel. At Scopely, we would we really wanted to do a real-time shooter. The tech wasn't there at the time. It is now. Uh, and we see that with Fortnite, but is Fortnite a, it's a great game. Don't get me wrong. Is it a great shooter? Not really. I want, I want somebody to do better. On PC and console, like, is there ability to innovate there? Oh yeah. Like they're still not doing live ops, even though they pretend. Like, like there are ways to make more money, to make users happier, to, to leverage those ecosystems uh, to the T. And I don't see the bigger companies doing that quite yet. Um, and PC is 100% converging with mobile. Like look at way or where Apple's taking iPad and Microsoft has the Surface. Those are tablets. Uh, that are computers that, and Microsoft's going to start releasing Android games on them. Um, it's crazy. They're all converging. So there's a lot of opportunity. Trust your gut, pick a genre you know, and go after it, and you'll do better. Um, for the bigger companies, I think there's obviously a bunch of consolidation. I think where they struggle is kind of where I was kind of heading uh, with a lot of embrace. It's, we're used by both, but in the bigger companies, it's not just creating the best metrics for your users and building those best experiences. It's really knowing 
how to capture the team and your own team. And the best engineers think of themselves as builders. And if you're going to make them happy, you've got to let them build games. And if you're, they're stuck in the weeds, not, and you're not actually building quality experiences or letting them do it because you have a series of bugs or you're pre-releasing your games or you're letting the incentives kind of come askew, they're going to leave. And I think that was honestly one of the biggest fears and our, our biggest accomplishment at Scopely was to build an environment where people didn't want to leave. Because in games, you can, and especially in Los Angeles, you can walk across the street and join another company. Uh, and at Scopely, our, we invested so much in not just the environment, which is easy and everybody talks about, but it's the culture of building and having users' experiences and making sure engineers knew that they were valued and product managers and UX and QA and that they were part of this team and that they were there to build cool stuff. You were touching upon some of the cool games, some of the cool ideas. So let's wrap it up with your favorite game you're currently playing and your favorite game of all time. Favorites all time is much easier. I have two young kids, 11 and seven. They're awesome. I, uh, I haven't fully opened the gaming can of worms because I want them to, to resist as long as they possibly can. Um, and so I don't get to try a lot of new games anymore. It's sad. Uh, uh, I'll put a, a pretend tier. The best games really understand the psychology of the users they're trying to attach. My psychology is I love narratives and I love stories, almost like movies. So my favorite games are like Bioshock back in the day. Uh, not the highest quality game, but the narrative was amazing. The mood it created, the, the pace was different. It wasn't like fast pace, like the tempo wasn't crazy. It was, it was moments of time. What I'm playing right now, I mentioned one, I'm heavily addicted to my own game, Star Trek, uh, which is another one that was, took a really long time to build with a lot of iterations for people out there and a lot of patience. Uh, but it's been around for five years now because they were patient before they released it. And then they kept iterating. And they're it, I'm very proud of that that team. That's mostly the same. Um, that was their building it while I was there, which is crazy. It's been around for a long time. Um, I love that game. Well, speaking of loving something, I have to say, I love this. I love this conversation, Eric, and I'm taking you up on that. You come back again if we just want to geek out about psychographics or go in user psychology yeah. and player psychology. You're welcome here anytime. Thanks so much. Happy to talk user marketing, too. Thanks for having You're me. On. It's, uh, it's been fun. That's a, that's a date. Thanks again. <laughs> This show is all about how to do your job better, how to make an amazing game, how to market it. And you have a say. So if you have a story or know someone we need to shine a light on, then we would love to hear from you. We want to hear from you. We want to reflect the reality of the mobile games market and all its wonderful complexity and strangeness. So if you have any suggestions for us, if you have any feedback for us, you can always get in touch. You can email us at podcast at pocketgamer.biz. You can find us on Twitter at pgbiz and you can reach out to us through the pocketgamer.biz website. If you're interested in listening to all of our podcasts, you can find them at pocketgamer.biz forward slash podcast. And we would love to hear your thoughts on future shows. And we've got you covered on all the major platforms. So subscribe to the audio podcast, as Brian said. Look for us on YouTube. If you want to read it, hey, you can do that too, because we have a companion post for you as well on the pocketgamer.biz website. Tune in again for the next edition of the pocketgamer.biz podcast and we look forward to speaking to you in the near future. Until then, I'm Brian Baglow. I'm Peggy Ann Saltz and that's a wrap until next week. Music.